Good morning, everyone. It's a nice rainy morning, eh? <laughs> Not nice and rainy? I guess if you were a monster. All right, so uh, get your Bibles and go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 12 through 19. So we're talking about the domino effect today. And so I need somebody, who, who's going to do the honors for me to knock these dominoes down? Come on, come on, come on, come on. All right. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 19. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the offense, of, from one offense, resulted in condemnation. But the free gift, which came from many offenses, resulted in justification. And verse 17 says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. The word of God for the people of God. Father in heaven, we thank you today, Lord God, for this opportunity that you've given us to come before you once again, Father, and just, Lord God, to be in your presence. We thank you that your word declares, Lord, where two or three gather in your name, there you are in the midst. We ask you today to touch us, Lord, where we most desperately need to be touched. Pray, Father, that you would have your way, move upon our hearts and our minds. And we ask, Lord God, that at the con uh, conclusion of hearing your word today, that we would not be the same, that our hearts would be affected, that our minds would be affected, and that, Lord God, it would have an effect in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. The domino effect. A growing effect produced when one event sets off a chain of similar events. The domino effect um, is exemplified, which is why it's called the domino effect, in the dominoes, as RJ will uh, demonstrate to you, what happens when one domino falls. Oh, good job. Thank you very much. All right. All right. All right. A growing effect produced when one event sets off a chain of similar events. One domino fell, and that domino affected another domino, which affected another domino, which affected another. As a matter of fact, the domino on the end, it fell. It was, it was going to fall because it was affected by the first domino. And sometimes we're like that in life, and we think that it's just me and it's nobody else, and it's my business, and what I do, nobody needs to be concerned with. But as we're going to see today, that, that we are connected in life. And we're going to talk about that. Um, the human race is connected. We're going to talk about how we're connected in our struggle, how we, we're connected when we, when we behave, when our behavior, good or bad, that there's a connection. And we're going to see this solution that we uh, read about, that we have a a negative connection, I call it, from Adam, where we are sinners. But then Christ comes along to break that connection and connect us to him so that we can have this positive connection and live and be who God created us to be. So I'll start off by talking about our connection that, um, as human beings because we are connected. We're connected uh, by our design. The Bible says that we were, clearly we are created in the image of God that every person on the earth is created in the image of God. As a matter of fact, Acts 17, 26 talks about how we, are all, we all come from Adam. The Bible says that, and he has made from one blood or from one man every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. 
From, from, so we all have a connection in some sense. We, you know, that's why I guess it's so, so silly when we have hatred and, 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 and things like that and all of these divisions because when we, when we go back, the further we go back, the more we see that there is a connection. As a matter of fact, at one point in history, everybody spoke the same, same language. Uh, you, you aware of that? Right? That at one point in history, I want to take us on a little reconnaissance and, uh, and, and look at this. So I'm going to share with you um, briefly uh, a few scriptures from Genesis chapter 11. So um, she'll bring them up on the screen as I uh, call them out, and you just kind of look at it. Um, if you need to just jot down the scripture uh, itself, Don't, you may not have time to write down the entire uh, passage. At one point in history, everyone spoke the same language, Genesis 11.1. 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. Unity, right? It's unity. Isn't that what we want? That's what we're looking for. That's what people are looking for? Unity, right? However, the domino effect created by Adam's sin was negatively affecting people. So the domino effect created by Adam's sin was negatively affecting people. We, we use this demonstration of these dominoes lined up. And there were, you know, just say there are 20 dominoes. And domino one falls, but domino 20 is still standing. And domino 20 said, hey, I'm still standing. I ain't got, no matter what one did, but eventually domino 20 fell because what happened with domino one affected domino 20. So Adam sinned, and that sin began to spread to everybody who came into the earth. Everyone who came into the earth. We talked about that in, in, in some ways a couple weeks ago, and we saw how Cain killed, uh, killed Abel. Genesis 11:4. the people said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Now, God created people to be united, but he created people to be united in righteousness and united in holiness, Okay? But as we see here, sin makes people unite in perverseness. If something is perverted, it's crooked, right? It's not straight with God. And so I want you to understand, because what somebody may be thinking is that, what's wrong with, what's, what was wrong with this? What's wrong with these people were united, and they're going to build a tower. Why is this, why are you saying this is perverted, Pastor? Why are you saying this is sin? This, this, this temptation that the people had, this desire to build a tower and make a name for themselves, it goes back to the same temptation that Adam and Eve faced in the Garden of Eden. Don't you remember that God gave them the garden, but he gave them rules, and it was clear that he was God, and they would follow his word, and Satan comes along and says, you don't have to listen to God. You eat this off of this tree, and you're going to be. you be a God to yourself. Right? And the temptation of, of mankind has always been one of autonomy, meaning to run your own life. And, and it, still, it still exists today. And, and it comes in many shapes and forms. And sometimes it takes hip, hip categories and people today say, hey, man, you just do. You do you. What's the difference when somebody says do you than Satan saying, look, eat off of it. Forget about what God says. Eat off of this fruit and you're going to be like God, you're going to be a God to yourself. You can run and call your own shots. And the people here say, hey, look, we are unified. Let us build a tower and let us make a name for ourselves. I'm not supposed to try to make a name for myself. There's a guy who made a song, and the song was called Famous, and he said, talking about Christ Jesus, he said, I just want to make you famous. The glory is for God. It ain't for me. So the people were united, but they were united in perverseness. It was crooked. It wasn't straight with God. They wanted to build and, and, and build a beautiful world without God, which people st still try to do today, which is impossible. Cannot happen. People try to fix the problems of life without God. And the problems exist because we've left God out of the picture. So what God said in, in Genesis eleven seven. He said, come, let us go down. He said, let us go down. One of the, uh, uh, the, the many indications in the scripture that we get to understand that God is triune, that he's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so he says, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. 
And so God came down to confuse the language, and the people couldn't work anymore because some people were speaking one language, some people spoke another language, and they couldn't understand each other. And God used the language barrier to get people to separate according to languages. And then it would be natural, right? People who understood each other, they would kind of migrate uh, together, and other people who understood a certain language, they would migrate, and, and we got people who speak Mandarin over here and people who speak, you know, China, uh, you know uh, Spanish over here. And God scattered them. And ver- Genesis chapter 11, verse 8 says, So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Because in God's eyes, this was not good. It was not straight with him. It was perverted. They were unified, but they were not unified in what was good and what was right. So part of my job as pastor is to, is to, is to, you know, is to teach you God's word and to make sure that you, you're prepared as much as possible when people, for critics who come and say different things that you've been exposed to it. Um, or maybe you can even you know, answer honest questions that people have. So one, one of the, if you haven't heard, one of the criticisms that people would make of, of God, who, those who want to criticize God, would say, God is the one who started the vision. Have you ever heard that? People say, God is the one who created the vision at the Tower of Babel right here. He, he, he confused the people's language, and he started all this division. And we got division now, you know, one country against another country, black against white. God started the vision. And you say, how do I answer that? So it's not extremely difficult. Because first of all, God scattering the people was an indication of a greater separation that already existed. Sin separated us from God. Sin separated us from God. It separated us from righteousness. And the people were united. But I'm going to say something. Unity can be a good thing, but all unity is not a good thing. So what do you mean? Well, wait a minute. I, Al-Qaeda was unified. <laughs> they were unified in their quest to destroy America. Is that a good thing? They are, wait, what, what about the Ku Klux Klan? Is it, do we want them to be unified? Would that be a good thing? There are people who wish that there was a universal unity for abortion on demand. That unity, is that a good unity? I don't think so. All unity is not a good, we must be united in righteousness, united in holiness. Then it is a good unity. And God is not interested in our idea of unity. Because as a sinner, my idea of unity is normally going to be perverse. It's going to be perverse. And that's what happens. We, we see it sometimes, the temptations we face in churches. People, you, have, you go to church, and people inside of a church, learning God's word, and we, we get little groups of unity. We call them cliques. But there's unity in those cliques, but it ain't righteous. Because you, what happens, when, you can tell when it's unrighteous because it locks other people out. There are those that long for a day when worldwide religion would be rejected. There would be a worldwide rejection of religion, unified in the rejection of religion. All unity is not, is not good. God is not interested in our feeble and often perverted attempts at unity. So much so, there's a, one of the most surprising statements of Jesus came in Matthew 10, 34. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace on earth, but a sword. I tell you, the first time I saw that, I had to do a lot of thinking to try to, you know, get to figure out what in the world is Christ talking about. Because what human beings, we would normally say the best thing that could happen in the world is that we all would be at peace. And here Jesus says, look, I did not come to bring, to make all y'all get along. He's, he's not a cosmic riding the king, right? Can't we all just get along? He came to bring peace between man and God. And once we have peace between man and God, then we can have peace with others. But there'll be no true peace if I don't first have peace with with God. And and the way it stands now, the most certain unity that we have is that we're all born sinners. We're We're unified in that. We are unified as sinners, but this unity is what is what produces division. Now, I know that sounds oxymoronic that, wait a minute, you're saying unity produces division, but the the unity of us as sinners, because sin naturally divides. It separates people. It separates 
us from God, and if we're separated from God, it's no small wonder that we will be separated from each other in all types of issues. Racial, social, religious divisions are all the effects of sin. Racial division is because of sin is in the world. Religious divisions exist because sin is in the world. Social divisions exist because sin is in the world. And through Christ, our unity with God and one another is restored. And that's why Jesus says, Father, I came, I, I want them to be one as we are one. And he wasn't talking about everybody in the world. He's talking about those who are in Christ, those who are in him. Because we only have the potential for true unity when we are in, in Christ. Because if I'm not in Christ, I'm in sin, and sin naturally divides. And it can look, that's why you have people, best of friends, best of buddies, best, you know, hang, oh, they love each other. And all of a sudden, bam, boom, they can't stand each other anymore. What happened? It's not, I mean, it, it's anything. Because if you're not in Christ, there's no real unity. There's no true, it's conditional. It's based on situations. It's based on you doing what I do. You satisfy me. I'm all right with you. That's why God is expecting us as Christians to be able to overcome uh, offenses and things like that, that we don't split up and break fellowship because somebody upset me, because somebody made me mad, because they offended me. He expects that Christ on the inside will give us the ability to say, I forgive you. Amen? Wow. So um, we are connected as human beings so much so that we are connected in our struggle. Now, I understand that we may fight on different sides in, in, in this life. We see people fighting on different sides. But let me tell you something. This is not a black-white battle. It is not an, a, an America versus foreigner battle. It's not a political party battle. It's not even a denominational battle. The battle you know, that humans have, we have one common enemy, and he is Satan. And each one of us have been targeted by him. And at some point, we've been victim of his schemes. We've been victims of his schemes. At some point, right? At some point, I know. That's why 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, Peter says this. He says, look, you got to be sober. Right? you got to be clear-headed. you got to be vigilant. Right? you, you, you got to be on your guard because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Peter says, this is how you handle him. You must resist him being firm, steadfast in the faith. And that's why we don't have time to, uh, to hold grudges because we need one another. We need our prayers. We need our encouraging. And that's what God provides the community for. Because no man is an island. We are connected. Connected. And if we're not fighting Satan and sin, we're not fighting Satan and sin through, through faith and through prayer and through righteousness and through obedience to God. If we're not fighting Satan and sin, we are laboring in, in vain. You're laboring in vain. You're fighting a useless fight. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you this, that God requires us to unite in our fight against sin. He requires that. Because to unite against sin is to stand with Jesus. Let me give you a scriptural reference to help you out here. 1 John 3.8. The Bible says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, he was brought forth, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. You and I are required to fight against sin. First our own, and then the sin in the world. To stand and fight against it is to stand with Jesus. The Lord requires us to fight against sin because sin fights against humanity. Are you hearing me? Sin fights against humanity. The rapes, murders, uh, domestic abuses, child abuse, infidelities, racism, all of these, et cetera, et cetera. Every sin that exists, those, or shall I say, all of these things that exist, they come from sin. They, and, they, and they make victims of people. They make victims of people. And we must understand the connection. Jesus said, uh, the Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. 
We must understand the connection, that we can't just be like people of the world who don't understand Christ and fight against sins that bother us. We must fight against all sin. Because think about what we, what we read initially in Romans 5, 12. Death came into the world through one man, right? So sin, came, sin came into the world through one man, and death came in through sin. You see that connection? We've got one man. You'd be like, man, do your thing. Adam, do what you want to do. It ain't nobody's business. I mean, you ain't harming nobody. And he violates God, and sin is in the world. And now the sin that we're facing is more than eating the fruit off a tree. We've got to lock our doors. We've got to take precautions. People got to watch their children. You got to tell your children, you know, uh, don't get in the car with strangers. Be careful. That, that grown men will go around trying to pick up little kids and, and abduct them. Are you with me? And all of that started from something that if you look at it on the surface, you say, ain't that big of a deal. I was at a funeral, and, and that's when God really kind of cemented this in my heart. It just, I was at this funeral one day, and it was so sad. It was, there was so much grief there. And I can remember God just, you know, he took that moment to, to get it in my heart. Sin does this. Sin, sin causes this grief. Sin breaks people's heart. It, it, rips, it rips the rug right from under life. And God asked me to quit. He said, how could you ever be friendly to any sin? Because any sin is every sin. Because they're connected. So, let's move on. We're connected um, in our design, created in God's image. We're connected in in our struggle. We all fight against Satan. And we, the sooner we can understand that, the better. So we'll stop fighting against each other and stop holding grudges against each other and stop being mad because we're understanding that, as my pastor used to always say, that Satan throws rocks and hides his hand. That we fight against the devil. The third thing I want to tell you is that you don't sin alone. No one sins alone. Re remember Adam in the garden. Sin came into the world through one man. Death came through sin. Domino effect. It's, and it's commonplace in our society uh, to hear things like, it's no one, nobody's business what a person does in their own private life. You ever heard that? It's nobody's business what a person does in their private life. Or you hear terms like, hey, it's a victimless crime. Right? I mean, people, you know, people do it. There's no victim. Well, tell that to, tell that to, to Adam and, and see. Well, Adam, it's a victimless crime. It's basically what Satan was saying, huh? This is all about you and, and your future. But what Adam did, and what he did was ate a fruit off of a tree that God said don't eat off of. He violated God's command, and it seemed as though it was victimless, or at worst, it would only affect Adam. But what happened? Every struggle that you have faced, it goes back to that. It's traced back to that. Every difficulty that you have faced, every hardship, every loss, every, every person you have lost, every surgery that you've had, every sickness, it is traced back to Adam. Just like those dominoes that we knocked down earlier. The 20th domino fell because the first domino started it, because they were connected. There's no such thing as a victimless crime. Sin changes the person that yields to it. You don't sin and stay the same. You don't sin and get better. So sometimes people are tempted and they have great temptations to do something and they're fighting it and they hear a voice inside saying, why don't you just yield, give in to it so they can get it out your system? The devil is a liar. It doesn't get out your system. It gets deeper in your system. Sin changes people. It does not, it, it makes you worse. And this, I was thinking about this, and I said, look, the common testimony of human beings is that I am not perfect. And I ask you this today. If you are not perfect, you think the world needs to worse you? Sin will make you worse. It will make you worse. A couple of weeks ago, I told you about I told you about Ted Bundy's testimony. And Ted Bundy was doing what people today call a victimless crime. He was looking at porn magazines as a young boy. Which, by the way, the only reason porn industry exists is because women were enticed by money to, satis to, to, you know, to show themselves naked to satisfy the perversions of men. 
And it's because sin was in the hearts of men, and sin does not love. Sin does not love. Sin produces lust. And the difference between love and lust is that love gives at the sacrifice of self for the benefit of others, and lust takes at the sacrifice of others for the benefit of self. So when men look at those at pornography, they're not trying to love those women. They're, they want the women to be exploited so that they can satisfy the perversion in their hearts. So anyway, you, I told you about uh, Ted Bundy, and he was doing what people would call a victimless crime. He's just at his house. He's not bothering anybody, and he's just looking at these porn magazines. But Bundy's testimony, his, his, by his own testimony, was that something changed inside of him. It began to change the way he viewed women. He didn't view women as objects of respect. He viewed them as objects to satisfy whatever desires he had. And when his desires got really bad, his view of woman, women had already changed. And when he desired to bludgeon them in the head and kill them, I mean, something had already changed inside of him. And we call that a victimless crime. God knows best. There's no such thing as a victimless crime. Sin changes people. It makes people worse. And if you are not perfect, my friend, believe me, the last thing we need, the last thing your husband, your spouse, your neighbor, the last thing your children need, the last thing your parents need is a worse you. We don't need a worse you. We need a better you. A better you. When I was thinking about this, I said, you know, King David is a good uh, biblical example for us. So in Acts 13, 22, this is what uh, God testified about David. Well, um, the Bible says that when God had removed him, him being Saul from being king, he, took, he removed Saul from being king and he raised up David, whom he also gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. This is God's testimony of David, that David was what? A man after his own heart. A little sinning along the way. Sin doesn't allow you to stay the same. It changes you. That's why Satan is satisfied to tempt you in small things because it changes you. When Paul told the Ephesians, he says that we're not ignorant of the wiles of the devil. And that word wiles is the method. It's a road that he travels because sin changes you. You do a little sin, and it changes something in you, and now you'll do something that you wouldn't have done before. And then when you do that, it changes you, and you'll do something now that you wouldn't have done before. That's why uh, what, what, what scientists and doctors have uh, understood, they call some drugs, uh, they used to anyway, we're getting so friendly with drugs now, they used to call certain drugs gateway drugs. In other words, they said, you know, the guy wouldn't just jump into uh, cocaine or heroin, but he can go through the gate and cigarette would be the gate, or maybe marijuana would be the gate. And it's a gateway drug to get you on the, on the road. That's what Satan does. That's what he does with sin. It gets you on the road, and it makes you worse. And so here's David. He has a testimony. He has a testimony from God that this is a man after my own heart, and a little sinning changed. They did something to him. And you remember when he saw Bathsheba, and he took her to be his, uh, killed her husband, took her to be his wife, wife and things like that. And Nathan the prophet came to David, and this is what he said. And I want to show you what uh, sin turned David into. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9. The one that God said, he's a man after my own heart. Something happened in life that changed him. And God says through the prophet, why have you despised the commandment of the Lord? To do evil in his sight. You've killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife. I wanted to key in a second that a man after my own heart. And then later on in life, we see that God has said, wait a minute. You have despised the commandment of the Lord. That, that doesn't jive necessarily with a man after God's own heart. Despising the commandment. What happened? Something changed inside of David, but I say kudos to David because he acknowledged that something had changed in him. And when he wrote that great psalm of repentance in Psalm 51, in verse 10, he says, God, create a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me because David says something in me has 
something in me has changed. Something in me has changed because there was a point in my life when I would not have done what I did. And in order for me to do that, something had to change. You've got to fight sin, guys, because sin will change you for the worse. It will change you. And when it, it, if you see a, a negative change in your life, don't deny it. Don't justify it, right? Oh, I'm just a man. I'm just doing We're all humans. Be like David and, and, and cry out to God in repentance. Lord, change me back. Fix what's wrong in me. Because repentance puts us back on track with growth and back on track with God. It puts us back on track with God and back on track with our growing and our maturity. And what God, Satan wants us to do is to kind of dabble in sin because sin will stunt your growth and it will actually make you worse. David's sin not only changed him, it rippled through his whole family. Which brought me to think about this, that normally when sin increases in a life, it makes casualties of those who love that person the most. When sin increases in a person's life, the people that are normally the first casualties are the people that love you the most. I say, mamas and daddies, you got to fight sin in your life for your children. Husbands, you got to fight sin in your life for your wife. Wives, you got to fight sin in your life so you won't make casualties of your husband. Children, you got to fight sin in your life so you won't break your mom and daddy's hearts. When, when, we, when sin increases, the first casualties, the first heartbreaks, the first people who are affected are normally those who care about us the most. David sin. And it was in his house where it began to see its effect at the most. So let, let, me, let me move to the solution. Because what we read in uh, Romans chapter 5 was that sin came into the world through one man, death through sin, and then death passed to all of us because all of us have sinned. And Christ came that just like many were made sinners through Adam, many can be made righteous through Christ. And so the solution for you and for me, the solution for the world, the solution for each person is that we sh must be connected to Christ by faith. By faith means trusting in his life and in his death as the propitiation for our sins, that his death satisfied the justice of God, that, that, that the wages of sin was death, and that Christ paid that price on the cross and it satisfied God's anger and his justice, and that we would trust in him, and, and it would connect us to God and justify us. And when God raised Christ from the dead by means of our justification, I love what Paul said to the Romans. He said he was delivered for our offense and raised again for our justification. And so we must trust in his life and his death and in his resurrection. And when we do that, he provides an ongoing solution to every issue that has befallen us because of sin, right? Every issue that has befallen us because of sin, Christ provides not just a, a solution, you know, today, but ongoing. And, and ongoing so that if 50 years from now I sin, the Bible says I have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus, the righteous. And if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Jesus says in John 15, 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. By faith, trusting in him, we are connected to Adam by our natural birth. Jesus came to break that connection to Adam, break that connection to sinful living, break that connection to death. And this happens for all who are in Christ or as it is commonly known, all those who are born again. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, 22 is the last scripture I want to share with you. The Bible says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. I guess as we sit here today, the real issue, when you boil it all down, is are we in Adam or are we in Christ? Because if I am in Adam, I'm headed for doom. If I am in Christ, then I should be able to enjoy life, life more abundantly, and have the hope of eternal life. 
See, when the dominoes in your life have fallen, and some, you know, and, and everybody's experienced that through sin. Well, man, there are things that have rippled, you know, through our lives, and we've done one thing, and it's caused another problem and another problem, and we've got broken relationships and casualties all along the way. When those dominoes have fallen, Christ is your only hope of them being raised again. And so I ended by saying this, trust Jesus because he is trustworthy.